you know, we've talked about electric school buses a lot. We've talked about municipal studies, but, um, you know, another really important part of this is how do we, what about our transit buses? So by 2025, I think it's like 80% of transit buses in the world are going to be electric. And how awesome is Doug Holcomb, the CEO of Greater Bridgeport Transit Authority, to um, talk about the awesome Proterra um, buses that they have there. So he is such a leader and such a champion, and I'm just honored and so grateful that we have Doug here with us today. So thank you so much, Doug, for joining us. Okay. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so um, thanks for having me and apologies for not getting the presentation to you until about, you know, two hours ago. Um, what I'm going to share with you is um, a city bus transit project for electric propulsion systems at Greater Bridgeport, but there's uh, many partners in it and we've been at it for quite some time. Um, the presentation that I have is abbreviated to fit in the time that we have today and there's a lot more to it. So I can share uh, a much more elaborate presentation details on any of the aspects uh, of it. So if you go to the first slide, I'll talk a little bit about the, the partnership. <clears throat> so we began the project um, um, around four years ago. And the first, the first effort that we made was to secure what the Federal Transit Administration was releasing as uh, they called the LONO program. So it was federal funding under the FTA available for the charging infrastructure and propulsion systems uh, that were zero emissions or low emissions. And we applied the first time with a, with a partnership that you see here. Um, we did not get the funding that we, that we looked for. It was supposed to be a 12 vehicle deployment uh, in one of the Connecticut Transit Divisions and in Bridgeport. And so uh, the next tranche, we applied again, and uh, we did not get that one. <clears throat> and so uh, we put the team together a third time, and the third time we did get a grant to do this work, but we did not get the full grant to do the 12 bus deployment. We got a low no grant scaled back to do about half of it. And the DOT agreed to partner with us and to try it in the, in the Bridgeport division. So GBT is actually the state's provider of bus transit in you know in Connecticut and so we formed a team and this is interesting for us because Daphne talked about the preparation of an RFP and that's normally what we do for rolling stock and any of the vehicles facilities any of our equipment <clears throat> but under the low note program because the technology is relatively new in its application to bus transit we um, we were able to partner with a manufacturer and at the time and I think still today one of the leading manufacturers of electric buses uh, is Proterra in South Carolina. So they have, they started in their manufacturing plant in South Carolina. They have one in Los Angeles now. And these numbers <clears throat> are growing all the time. So they're a little bit dated, maybe a month old, but they have, uh, they're among uh, one of the leaders in the deployment of electric buses. And the interesting thing about Proterra is they were, they're new, they're, they're, they have the electric propulsion system, but are new in the, in the family of vendors for um, for bus transit, and so um, we, we partnered with them really early on in the beginning. In fact, in the development of the grant application, and the next partner is the the DOT. The DOT has been a great partner here, and I, and it's not just a euphemism for money. They've provided uh, technical assistance. They've really helped us because we've stumbled on some facility improvements that we needed to have in place. I'll talk about that for the for the charging infrastructure. Um, they helped us with the rate and route model, and um, I am not an expert in electrical rates, and I'm, you know, I'm not even sure that there are any experts in electrical rates. Very difficult for us to understand. And then they did the matching funding for the vehicles and the matching funding for the charging infrastructure. So uh, they've been a great help for us. And we also had on board for another facility expansion and improvement project, Wendell, architects, but they also had a division uh, of folks that were experts in, or, you know, that understood the rate and could do the rate analysis, so we understood the cost. They helped us with the switch gear. and by that I mean uh, we stumbled into, during a facility assessment independent from this project, we found that our switch gear was 30 years old and maybe had three to five years. That was a six, seven hundred thousand dollar project. Uh, so we had to, in, in, the, in the course of this project, 
redesign the switch gear, rebid it, and rebuild the switch gear, and that finished up right around the holidays last year. And then probably the most important, or you know, in partner was a, a place called the Center for Transportation and the Environment, and they their mission uh, is it's a, a nonprofit with a mission of deploying electric propulsion systems in in this industry. So they've been doing the project management, the details of the route modeling, the rate modeling, and the specification development. And they'll be with us after we deploy the buses. So um, that's, it's, I mean, I, I say that because without that team, you know, an agency like ours wouldn't be able to really do this project, you know, uh, properly, I don't think. So um, next slide, please. And so I, um, in this normal presentation, I spent a lot of time talking about all these areas of specification development, the modeling of the routes, the modeling of the rates, and the infrastructure. I, I took out a lot of the intermediate slides, but I'll talk first about um, the, the route modeling. So before, th this was a very nerve-wracking part of the project because uh, what you hear from the salespeople at the manufacturers regarding the range of these buses is different from what you find when you model and you start to talk to the engineers and you develop specifications. So we looked at four different configurations of buses that were offered by Proterra. Four, 440 kilowatt um, battery pack, 660 watt kilowatt battery pack, and then um, uh, single drive and dual drive, uh, double drive uh, motors in, in the bus. And um, we looked at our routes and the first, we wanted to know where, what routes, what city routes are we gonna put these on? Because we had seen these deployed in other places and when we heard presentations, we would hear, well, that's an airport shuttle or that's a downtown loop. We wanted proper city buses with city bus range that could accommodate city bus loads. And in Bridgeport, we're averaging, well, before the event that we're experiencing now, 31 trips per bus per hour. Um, and so we selected the routes because we wanted a local, an interregional, and an express. But we, in transit, and I won't get too much into this, we do this thing called blocking, which is the assignment of a bus during the course of the day. So uh, the bus, the block, the block of time that a bus works out there. So you might have a bus out there for 16 hours, and two different drivers will do shifts on that bus. So blocking is important. <clears throat> so we we didn't select the blocking based on the length of the block or the time. So we went back and did a whole second iteration of this. So in this process, we're predicting um, how much energy will be used and what the distance, uh, the, what the range will be. And they're similar to what Daphne had in her, in her school bus slides in the 134, 150, 160 mile range. Typically in, in our service, we need about 210, 220 miles for a bus to be out you know, on a full block. And then um, this will kind of freak people out, but we also wanted to predict the impact of diesel-fired heat on the range of endurance. There is an option for a diesel-fired heater, a nine-gallon diesel-fired heater on these buses, and um, the idea of looking at that was, you know, even though it couldn't be a zero-emission bus, uh, uh, a supplemental heat would extend the range of the bus. It would still be very efficient. We don't intend to use these but they can't be added after the manufacturing process. And we expect once the next round of buses is released, we, the 660 kilowatt will give us the range that we need. So in the second iteration, we narrowed it down to the Proterra uh, 440 kilowatt. And one of the reasons here is in order to use federal money to buy a city bus, Federal Transit Administration, you have to meet Buy America requirements. And that essentially says that uh, you need around 75% of the components and final assembly in the United States. So that limits um, our that limits our ability to look at you know vendors outside of the United States. And in addition to that, the FTA requires that all buses that are purchased with federal money go through uh, Altoona, Pennsylvania testing, a Penn State facility there, and that takes some time. It can take a year or more. So essentially, the only one available to us through Proterra was the 440 kilowatt, and it didn't have the range we wanted. And so we took a five, what was supposed to be a five bus project and broke it into two phases. Why buy five buses with a range not quite sufficient for us when we could start with two, go to school on it, learn the technology, train the workforce, build the charging infrastructure, uh, and test it out, 
and we do have plenty of blocks that these that these um, or shorter pieces of work, you know, peak period morning and afternoon where these buses will work for us. And so we uh, we split into two phases. So that's you know we 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 use our loads uh, of passengers for weight, and I'll tell you in a little bit how important that has become. And we used our um, our terrain and our our uh, our grades, our specific routes. We put GPS equipment on the buses, and that's what was into the modeling. So I have there's much more sophisticated information about the modeling. I'd be happy to share with anybody. But before we spent the money here, we wanted to have a, a real idea, uh, not just a kind of a salesperson idea, but a real idea of what these buses were doing. And at the time we were doing this, we're talking to colleagues in the Northeast and on the East Coast that have already done some of this. Pioneer Valley in Springfield, Worcester, Mass, uh, folks in Providence at RIPTA and at the T in New York City, and then down in South Carolina at um, Clemson. So we've been, and, and we've been talking to them about it. So that's, that's how we uh, kind of estimated that we would be able to, you know, how long we'd be able to, to operate the buses. If you go to the next slide, I think there's more detail on that. <clears throat> This is just from the results, and we looked at, uh, we modeled them using, you know, in considering new batteries and uh, and then batteries later in their life. And uh, like Daphne alluded to in her presentation, nobody knows what the life of these batteries are going to be. There's none that are out there for six years, um, and that plays into warranty and replacement and midlife uh, rehabilitation and things. But in any case, the on the left hand side here, you see the block number. That's just the that's just a, an assignment of a bus, and then you see the route. That's the actual you know Route 10 on uh, Black Rock Turnpike, for example, the miles, and then the duration of that block. And after the modeling, we're able to see um, uh, with using just the battery systems and no auxiliary heat where where those buses would actually have the range and where they won't. So now we know where to deploy them. And using the auxiliary heat on the right, you can see it doesn't do too much really it gets us a little bit more under nominal conditions. And if you wanna know more about what nominal and strenuous conditions are, I can share that information separately because you know, it has to do with um, the total weight of the passengers, the equipment on board the bus, the temperatures, um, speeds, and all of that. Um, so that, that's just one page out of a, you know, a huge dictionary of modeling that we did. And they're similar for uh, all, all of the different configurations of the buses and also uh, new batteries versus versus age age batteries. You can go to the next, please. So once we um, once we had an idea of what the range would be for the bus, we started working on the specifications. And this is a, an interesting process for us because normally the spec would be developed, and we would put it on the street in the form of an RFP or an invitation for bids, and then. Um, the vendors would apply, and if there were any exceptions, we would consider them to what exceptions to the specification. But here, we're developing specifications jointly with a vendor that um, is a, is essentially a partner in this by virtue of the grant award under the Loan Oak program. So the bus we selected was the Proterra Catalyst E2. It's a 40-foot um, bus, 40 seated passengers, plus 14 standees, and I'll talk more about that. It's the 440 kilowatt battery pack, and this is depot charging. And that means that it charges in our garage at night. And there's a part of me, I was very disappointed in the first two iterations of the grant application that we didn't get uh, a grant. But this industry is moving so quickly that I'm glad we didn't get those two because back then we would be talking about in-route charging and charging infrastructure on the street at our terminal and at hubs. And that's enormously expensive and now the buses have the range um, to, you know, from, to a charge overnight. And then we took a specification, several different specifications, one that pr was provided by the American Public Transportation Association, one that is the one that we use in conjunction with Connecticut Transit and Connecticut DOT to buy buses, uh, you know, of any kind of propulsion system. And then we looked at the Proterra spec, and then we, we mushed those all together. And that was quite time consuming, but we had a really good team of people from Connecticut Transit and DOT in our maintenance shop. And then some of the concerns that came out of it were the weight. These things are very heavy. The Proterra bus is a, is a composite body. It's not a typical 
a steel structure with panels on it, like a like a, a, a typical city bus. And then during the development of, this, of the specs and what's called the pre-production meeting, we started hearing, uh, well, we may not be able to have any standees on this bus. Now that doesn't work in Bridgeport. We can't have that. Um, so we actually went back and worked with them, worked with their engineers, and and told them that we need, you know, these, these vehicles have to meet the federal bridge weight restrictions. We have to have standing capacity. Uh, we we were concerned with the composite body, but we're less so today. We've done a lot of training of our staff on that, and um, and then there's variations from a typical bus because this is a propulsion system company manufacturing a bus. There are certain things that uh, transit agencies take for granted that you get on any of the other man manufacturers, like uh, a, a easy. It would be easy to replace a, a wiper motor, for example, on a on a city bus in any of the fleets that we have now. This, however, uh, doesn't have that consideration and requires removal of the whole dashboard. So there's things like that, and and there's, for example, no place for a driver to hang her coat. There's just they're kind of small, but they're popping up as we go through this. And then we had to negotiate the, the specifications. So uh, we did the modeling and then we developed the spec and then we, and we worked with the vendor on that. So we can go, if we go to the next slide, tell me if I'm going too long. <clears throat> All right, so it's the Catalyst E2 Pro Drive and it's got two charging ports in the rear um, on either side so that helps us in the garage. So, and we agreed to depot charging, no on-street charging and 40 seated and no less than 24 standing. That's the contractual requirement now. We have the same uh, automatic vehicle location and telecommunication systems with automatic passenger counters that we have on other city buses. Uh, 12 camera, a sophisticated uh, a surveillance system, audio and video. We have a ProTran pedestrian protection system, which is an audio outside the bus. Um, and, a, and a, a protective driver barrier, and then USB ports for people's uh, mobile devices at all the seats. Now, uh, the reason that I list those is because one of the principles here was we didn't want to take anything away from the customers that they already have. You know, we, we thought we'd rob the, the idea of a, of, a, of a clean zero emission or low emission bus if you got in and it was freezing cold and you couldn't charge your phone and the seats were uncomfortable and it didn't have the same safety system. So we put all of those in there and we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that, that the customers would be happy and, and something that they were used to wouldn't go missing. And so we now have kind of a, a, a boilerplate specification package that we'll tweak going forward. My next slide, please. And Doug, we are gonna be wrapping up shortly. So um, for your okay. presentation, I'm just to let you know. Okay, I think I'm almost through it. So. And just a little bit about the rate modeling. Basically, we had to do an estimate of, uh, of, the, of how much this was going to cost. And so we took these, the assumptions on the left here. We did it for multiple types of vehicles. And um, these are the assumptions that we used. And then we looked at charging uh, on peak versus off peak, and then simultaneously charging the buses versus staggering the charges. So those are the scenarios that if you go to the next slide, it'll, it'll show you what, what we have. Um, so this this is a, I think this is an interesting slide. This show, shows us the annual cost of charging the vehicle simultaneously. So if you have two, five, or 11, which are the phases of this project, the first two, and then five more, and then 11, and that's what the charging infrastructure was built for, you see that using in a 60 kilowatt charger, uh, $35,000 versus 53,000 using 120 kilowatt, which is what we ultimately bought, versus diesel. There's a slight savings versus the cost of the diesel using the assumptions. Of course, if you can predict what diesel fuel will be for the next 12 years, I would like to hire you. Um, so not much of this is simultaneous. If you go to the next slide, you see a much bigger savings if we stagger the charging. One bus charges, and when that's done, the next bus charges. Easy to do with two, possible with five, gets much more difficult with 11 and 50 and 100. Um, but you can see you can see the savings uh, using a 120 kilowatt charger versus the cost of diesel, and those are our, those are the different phases on the right hand side. Next slide, please. This is another slide that shows that shows what the savings would be. And I don't have information to share with you today on the overall savings versus the total cost of the buses, but I'll share those costs at the end of the presentation. Next slide. 
just briefly, these are the times we, we have to be able to service these buses during the times we service all the other buses, which is typically at night. They start rolling in after the evening peak and we finish up about one in the morning. Fortunately in Connecticut, the, uh, the rates for electricity are the same off peak as they are on shoulder, which gives us a big chunk of the day to be charging the buses. And charging a 440 kilowatt bus with a 121 kilowatt charger is, you know, three hours in the area of three hours per bus. So um, plus or minus. So next slide, please. But I tell you that because I want you to know that there's these things that the transit agency have to consider in order to service the buses and and uh, and some of the things that we had to go through to get to where we are. And at our cross street facility, this is a picture of the old transformer, which has been swapped out for a new transformer. Um, the, we've done the installation of all of that. We've done all of the replacement of the switch gear. We just finished last week installing the um, chargers um, at the facility. We built the system for 11 buses and um, phase one is two chargers are installed, but the whole thing is, is built for 11 and we stubbed it out, so to speak, for five chargers. So we're good for the next couple of years as we grow the electric fleet. But uh, uh, there's a lot of money that has gone into it. It's a 700,000 in switch gear, um, and then uh, another $60,000 per unit for the chargers, and then another $73,000 for all the installation of that. Um, so it gets, it gets quite expensive, and that's all a uh, combination of federal transit and state money. Sure. Next slide, please. Just a little bit about the impact, and this is all, this information is produced by a Center for Transportation and the Environment. So in phase one, which is two uh, vehicles, um, that would be the mileage and the, the number of gallons of diesel fuel reduced and the tailpipe emissions reduced. And, and this slide shows this for all three phases of the project. And then they went ahead and did a net net change after you consider using the kind of electricity in Connecticut after you consider um, the emissions associated with the energy plant. So the next slide shows a, a reduction to this because there is, you know, what about the, the power plant? So these are some assumptions we made using information, um, I think from DEEP, but we're looking at tailpipe emissions and, and then uh, taking out of that um, the power plant emissions and having the net reductions. And so that's what we're looking at. I think the next slide will show you kind of some perspective on that. Um, also, some of the other pollutants, volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, and particulate matter. And then, uh, then of course, the, the next one shows just they put it in kind of um, – you know, trees and, and acreage, you know, to try to, we're trying to answer questions that we anticipate from people about, sure, it's zero emission tailpipe, but the energy is generated somewhere. There's still a net, a, a big net reduction. Um, and I'm, I think that that might be the end of it. Um, and I can, and I'll be, I don't know if there's another slide after this. I think, I think that's the last one. Okay. So and I'll, be, I'll try to answer any questions that you have. <clears throat> Great. So um, I think that was a great presentation. There were um, a few questions and I know we're running a bit behind, um, but someone had asked what switch gear was. Um, so if you could just kind of describe what that means in, in sure. transit it's, buses. Sure. It's, it, that's actually the facility. So all of the electrical switches and circuit breakers and all of the main electrical components, uh, like the electrical room in the facility, that was all 30, 32 years old. That all had to be replaced. And, and the point of sharing that with you is that's something to consider if you're working at a bus garage or another transit garage that isn't fairly new. So it's not just a matter of the chargers, it's the entire charging infrastructure. And it's, we probably could have done this, but it would not have made sense to do it and then go back and done the switch gear. And, and there is one other thing that I forgot to tell you. The, um, it, and that's the status of the project. The buses are built and they're on the property at Proterra in South Carolina, and I can't take delivery of them because we can't do any training, and we're not bringing the people from New York to do the bus wraps or commissioning the electrical systems. So until the until the current virus problem uh, subsides, uh, there's going to be delays in that. In the meantime, we're ready to go with all of it. And if you had a question about the cost, the unit cost per bus 
is 990,000. So they're enormously expensive compared to the city buses. But everybody, as the industry gets into this, everybody projects that that cost will come down, uh, and that the bat every month and every you know every quarter the batteries and the range are getting better, and the product is is moving. So we consider this somewhat of a, 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 of science, not really an experiment. I mean, we're confident in work, but uh, we expect uh, for us this is ground level, getting in, having the workforce understand, working in high voltage environments, all of that. Um, and, um, and, and that's what FTA made the money available for. Great, well, thank you. There are some other questions that maybe we can do some follow-up later on um, either. Sure. Um, so that's great. Thank you very much, Doug, for your presentation. Okay. Sure, thanks for having me. You all have my contact information, so you know, anytime you wanna reach out, I'll be there. Great, thanks, Doug, if we appreciate it. Um, thank you. A round of applause for Doug. <laughs> Yay, thank you, Doug. It was awesome. Excellent. Thank you all very much.